distributed as being one who met with God face to face. When God spoke to him, he didn't speak in riddles or with dark sayings like he did to the prophets, but he spoke to him face to face as with a friend. In the midst of that relationship, Moses makes this response, I guess, to, to God. He says, Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, Do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and all of your people from all of the other people on the face of the earth? Moses' great desire for the presence of God was to the extent where a whole nation was stuck with the pause button on. See, you, you, you've got us on this great exodus. You've rescued us from 400 years of slavery. You're leading us around in the wilderness where miracles are abounding. You want to take us into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. Yet if your presence... If your presence departs from us, if your presence doesn't go with us, if your presence is not upon us, we're not going to move from this place. And out of that great cry of Moses' heart, that great place of intimacy, God shows him his glory. So you can't see my face like you've asked, but I'm going to cause all of my glory to pass by you. As he hit him on the cleft of a rock and covered his eyes with his hand. And as God was passing by in all of his glory, Moses heard this, The Lord, the Lord, slow to anger, abounding in love. He's gracious and compassionate. His mercy lasts from generation to generation. Father, tonight in the midst of your presence, we acknowledge that that's who you are. You are the Lord. You're the King above kings. You're the Lord above all lords. You're the one true living God. Your presence is on us, your people. We hunger for it. We, we thirst after it, Lord, like a deer that pants for the streams of water. And we say that you are gracious and you are compassionate. You are slow to anger and you're abounding in love. And we receive that tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Can you say amen to that tonight, church? Amen. Very cool. Well, we're going to give the Musos a great hand right now. It's cool. I kind of feel a little bit fuzzy. <laughs> it's a good thing. It is. It's, it's, it, it's the presence in the place. I, I, I love what Charlotte bought. I just, wow, I've, I, I've had the privilege of hearing some of that message over the last month or so. But, but, but every time she's brought it up, I'm like, wow, I'm, I, I, I'm like sitting back in the chair with my mouth open going, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. I like, wow. You know, I, I, I there's a statement that she makes, that she made tonight as she was, as she was ministering to us, that sometimes love looks like being undone. It's okay to be undone in his presence. And I would say this to you prophetically tonight, Charlotte, that you, there's an anointing that you carry to, to, to lead people into a place of undoneness, which is we're creating new words <laughs> for what you carry. But, but it's true. And, and, and it's not it's, it's not an exposure. It's not an undoneness of, of, of being exposed or, um, like you said before, it, it, it might look a little bit messy sometimes, but it's not without grace and it's not without purpose. It, it's, it's like this. The, the, the image that I get is God's getting you around people who have sewn up and stitched up their own wounds or, or it's like their clothing and they've, they've grabbed whatever patch they had on hand at the time and stuck it to themselves 
and, and instead of with like a surgeon's needle, I've got like the, 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 the big one that you use on wool sacks to <laughs> you force it through and oh, there's like, there's, there's, there's like a huge thing of string attached to it. Like, oh, it hurts. <laughs> and it looks bad and messy, but at least I'm covering that area of my life. But it's like this, that the undoneness part of it is I can see you with, with, with surgically sharp scissors snipping through those stitches and as you pull the patch away, as you lead people into being undone in his presence, it's revealing the good work that God's already done underneath the horrible patch that we put on ourselves sometimes and it's exposing something of the, the, the glory and the, 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 the renewal and the redemption that God's already t- causing to take place in their lives. So, Father, we want to bless Charlotte tonight. We thank you for what she carries. And, and, and when we say thank you, that there is an anointing on her to lead others into wholeness in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Very cool. That was me whistling, by the way. I spent 37 years trying to perfect that in this. <laughs> it's still not working for me very well. Same with clicking my fingers. Yep. Oh. Yeah. See, 50% of the time. But God still says I'm amazing. So I, I receive that. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And he's saying that to all of us tonight. You, you, I, I don't care where you're at or what you're thinking. He says you're an absolute champion. He, he, he's, he's making a boast right now about who you are. He's going, look, I've created them. I've, I've fashioned and formed them. I've called them. I've, I've, I've ordained them. I've, 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 I've written in my book every day that they were created to experience, and I'm inviting them, and I'm drawing them into it. I, I want to talk to us tonight out of the Valley of the Dry Bones story in Ezekiel chapter 37. It's kind of this crazy story that that really talks about the Israelites and God doing something amazing no matter what the conditions. The Valley of Dry Bones is this picture of utter despair and desolation. It's like, wow, something tragic has, has, has transpired here. This is a place of destruction. This is a place of, of death and despair. It's, it's like, and, and, and God, Ezekiel's a prophet. He's, he's got a whole book written about him with like 40-something chapters in the Bible. And, and, and God continuously, as you read through the book, he continuously takes Ezekiel uh, in, the, in the spirit to, 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 to have visions and revelations. And, and this is one of those things where the hand of the Lord's come upon him and, and, and taking them out to this valley of dry bones. And it seems kind of like a funny thing to talk about because I, I, I'm often looking for the field of dreams, not the valley of dry bones. Like, ah, oh, valley of dry bones, no. Nope. I, don't, I don't want anything to do with that. That looks like a hard place. Somebody's already tried and failed, obviously, because they're lying there dead. They're, 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 their bones are rotting away into the ground. But you don't want to pass by an opportunity to see God do something amazing. I mean, we can look at those things sometimes and say, look, it, 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 it's no use working on that. Somebody else has already tried and failed. But the great thing is that there's resurrection power on the inside of us. Romans 8 and verse 11, I think it is, says, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you and I. Like, wow, we can look on dead things and hopeless situations and valleys that are filled with dry bones and, and, and say, you know what? There's, there's an opportunity here. There's, 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 there, it looks like they're dead and gone. But there's resurrection power that's yet to come. There's three ways that this story is, is generally interpreted. We often speak about it in, in, in uh, relation to revival as well. But I, mean, I, I, I just briefly want to mention this tonight. Because you can read through it and think, you know, it, it's a prophetic picture of the resurrection of the dead in the last days, the, you know, in the end times when Jesus comes again. I, I, theologians agree with that. I, oh, amen, that's great. It can be looked at as a spiritual teaching on salvation and a picture, I guess, of um, raising up those who are spiritually dead and being made alive by the Holy Spirit, all that's transpiring in there. Or at the time that Ezekiel was functioning under this unction, if you like, speaking about the restoration of Israel. 
from their state of captivity in, in, in Babylon. They've, they've, they've been taken captive. The whole nation's been ransacked. Most of the people have been carried away into captivity into, into uh, the, the nation of Babylon. And uh, then there was this destruction that was wrought on them by the, another nation, the Chaldeans, as they came and invaded the land whilst most of the people were enslaved. There was no army to speak of left in the, in the nation. So the Chaldeans, they just came in like a swarm of locusts. And, and had their wicked way. They took whatever they wanted. They ransacked where they, where they pleased. And so this whole deal when Ezekiel's prophesying is, is speaking about the restoration of Israel. I want to read through this a little bit tonight, from probably from verse 1 to, to 11, so we get a clear idea of what we're really talking about. It says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know, which is the best answer <laughs> that Ezekiel could give, because really, what do we know? We, we, we know a little bit, but God knows everything. We just go, oh, I, actually, God, I don't really know, but what do you say about the matter? Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And I love this. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Do you, do you, you realize that the word of the Lord is filled with life. It's, I, I've said this before, but I just think it's so true. It's like, the Word of God is like a spiritual defibrillator. And it has the ability to shock us back into life as we read through it, and it comes alive to us. It begins to, to, to swim before us on the page. We go, wow, there's something in that. There's, there's something in that statement. There's something in that story. There's something in the context of what's going on there that's breathing fresh life into me. I thought that area of my life was dead. I thought that dream, I thought that hope I had, had, had passed away. Yet as I read through what Scripture says there's something of resurrection power, of life, of truth that's bringing back to life these hopes and these dreams and these aspirations that I had. I, I have no idea what Ezekiel was saying as he was prophesying. And I was thinking about this this afternoon. And, cause it, it, it's funny. I never, I, I heard this song. I, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. I mean, okay, you know, that'd be right. The, 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 the hip bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones connected to the shin bone. I mean, it, this sounds vaguely like it's connected to the story. I had no idea that it was uh, the songs written about the story of Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm onto something here. I'm on. Then we looked it up on, online. I said, okay, what's this song from? And it's all about Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones. So, when well, amen, that's kind of cool. But, well, let's carry on. Verse 5 says this. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these, says, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I find it very interesting that the first thing that happened for Ezekiel as he was prophesying was that he heard a sound. He didn't see anything transpiring, so to speak, but he actually heard a sound. And I, I want to go back to, for those of you that were here this morning, Pastor Dale preached an amazing message on, I, I, I guess, really just living in this living and loving relationship with God. And, and she made a great statement that, God doesn't communicate to us the way that our brain wants to engage with. He, he communicates to us spirit to spirit. And I think there's something happening here as Ezekiel hears the sound of bones coming together, bone to bone, and this rattling noise. Because uh, all throughout Scripture, this kind of deal is happening. There's, there's, there's the great story in, the, in, in, the cha in, in, in Acts where the disciples are gathered together in the upper room and they're all together in one accord and they're praying, but they hear a sound of a mighty rushing wind before they see anything. 
Elijah when he defeats the prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal. He goes to see Ahab the king and says, you know what? You better go and hitch up your chariot because I can hear the sound of a heavy rain. And that's even before he went up and bowed down seven times and prayed until he seen the, the, the fist the size of a man's, the cloud the size of a man's hand. He ran back and said, look, you, the, the rain's coming. But, but he heard the sound. There's something about this in, in, in the realm of the prophetic where we begin to hear a sound. We begin to hear something, and it's like sometimes it could be coming from a long way off. We grab a hold of that. That's why it's so important to spend time in his presence, because we'll pick things up about uh, what what God is about to do. So it says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise and a rattling sound. Oh, we've read this, but the, 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 the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath ended them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. And the story continues. There's so much in this that we could pull out and extrapolate and, 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 and speak on. But I want us to focus on verse 11 tonight, just for a wee bit longer. I'm going to read this again. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. And listen to this. They say, because it gives us great insight into why the Israelites continue to be in this condition. Why is it that they appear as this valley of dry bones? Why do they think that about themselves? Why do they feel it? Why are they experiencing that? I think this gives us great insight into that. It's because they say, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. So all of a sudden, you can see that they've got this wrong confession. They say, our our, our bones are dried up. You know, Proverbs 18 and verse 21 puts it this way. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So, and we understand that, that there, there, there is, there's, there's life in the words that we use, or there's death in them. If, we, if our confession over our own lives is, my bones are dried up, I'm dry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm weary, I, 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 I'm thirsty, but I don't know where to get a drink, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm turning to dust. Well, eventually that'll become your reality. We need to change our confession. That's why declarations are so good. And I love, we, we Pastor Dale introduced the um, declarations. It must have been a few years ago. You had the declaration from Patricia King. And, you know, and, and, and we made a big deal about it because it was a big deal. Where you begin to confess Scripture over your life because it's filled with truth and it's filled with life. That's why I find myself confessing Scripture most every time I pray. And it's not some religious repetition that I'm trying to train myself to do. It's not, you know, uh, it's not swinging the... <laughs> the smoking handbag excuse the pun but but there's that's why when I'm trying to invest in my life with the word of God that I'm underlining it and I'm trying to memorize scripture not so that I can seem smart or I'll have something to say when I've got the microphone in my hand and I'm and I'm preaching but it's it's not just about committing it to memory but it's so that I will realize that every time I read it, every time I see where I've scribbled something down or underlined something, that there's something about that that's got life on it for me. There's something about that, that that's speaking to me. There's something about it that I want to remember to confess over my life. Or not just my own life. It's not just this, this me, me, me deal. But we can confess it over our city, over our nation, over nations of the world, over friends, over family, because it's truth and it's life. We can so easily carry the wrong confession. I don't know if you've heard it before, but I, but I bet you'd be familiar with it if you have. It's like, well, I'm going to fail. I'm going to lose. I'm going to suffer. It's too hard. It's not fear. All these things, we speak to ourselves sometimes. I'm no good at this. Oh, wow. I, I used, when I first took on my job at the, at, 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 the, at the gardens, Rainfield Gardens that we ran, 
and I had to start doing some administration work on the computer. And like, oh wow, I I would I would speak badly to the computer. I would speak poorly to the machine because it was failing me. And I and and but then it turned to myself because I went, oh, this thing is not doing. Every time I seemed to push a button, something would go wrong. Be like, man, I'm useless. I I'm really bad at. This. I suck at this. And Leah, amazing Leah up here. She would come in, she'd hear me doing this sometimes, she'd go, what, what are you saying to yourself? Why you don't say that? And I'm thinking, well, it, well it's just a statement. It's just, it's just me re- reacting to what's happening around me. But it was actually the negative confessions that we make over ourselves. And, and, and there's life or death in the power of the tongue. So, I, so now I'm reminding myself, because things still go wrong for me on the computer, on the, on the crazy machines. But I'm reminding myself, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. I've got, some, I've got some secret skills. I've got some hidden talent. <laughs> I'm an IT professional. Not quite on that level, but, but we can so easily carry the wrong confession. And, 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 and there's a confession in the Word of God that is good for us. And, and it highlights part of the reason why it's so good for us to feed ourselves with scriptural truth. We can begin to say, that I've got life in all of its fullness because that's what Jesus came to give me. That I've got a God who is always leading me in triumph. That I've got a God who's causing me to rise on eagle's wings. That with God I gain the victory. That by his stripes I'm healed. That if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ and that he's risen, then I'll be saved. And if it's true of the most powerful moment of our lives when we step into relationship with him and it's got to be true it makes sense of of every other part of our life that if we can can, it's amazing what can happen when our heart and our mouth are in agreement with each other it's like there's this 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 powerful thing that begins to happen it's like wow all of a sudden i'm stepping into something amazing and you got to understand we we're we're in this kind of battle or this contention, there's, there's, there's something. In that same passage that I quoted, John 10, 10, it says that Jesus has come to give us life and life in all of its fullness or, or all of its abundance. But the devil comes that he might steal and kill and destroy. He's always looking to do that in our lives. It's not that we should live in fear and trembling of who he is because he's a toothless lion. I love, we, we, we did that the other Saturday morning when Dave was speaking at the men's breakfast. It's like, he's, a, he's, 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 good, he's going to try and gum you to death. Well, that's not going to be very effective. It might make me a bit wet and sloppy, but you ain't got no teeth, buddy. You might be trying to steal and kill and destroy from me, but I'm living under the, 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 the name of the one who's come to give me life and all of its abundance. I think it's Ephesians 6 says that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 10, in verse 4 through 5, it says that um, though we wage war, well, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds and every high thing which exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we have this ability to, to, to take every thought into captivity and bring it into the obedience of Christ. And, 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 and for me, that kind of bringing our thoughts into the obedience of Christ is, is realizing who we are, is beginning to make a good confession over our lives, saying, you know what, I'm, I'm created to be a priest and I'm created to be royalty in the earth. I'm a son or I'm a daughter of the Most High that He's imbued me with power from on high, that I've already received an anointing from the Holy One, that, he's, that He teaches me all things. He's leading me and guiding me in truth. He loves me. He's for me. He's not against me. He's got the best for me. He knows the plans that he has for me for good and not for evil, for a hope and a future. If I call to him, he'll answer me and show me great and mighty things that I do not know. He is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? He's the strength of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? Whenever I'm afraid, I trust in him and God whose word I praise. What can flesh do to me? All these things are scriptural truths that as we begin to declare them over our life, I, I don't know about you, but there's something that begins to happen on the inside of me. It's like it emboldens my soul. 
I mean, it's not that I don't get down sometimes. Sure, I can trudge around the mountain and I sink, sink deeper and deeper into the muddy so my head gets down. I go, wow, hang on. Wait a moment. I don't have to be stuck in this path in life. I don't, I don't have to be entrenched in what the devil thinks about me or what other people are trying to serve up on me. He's the glory and the lifter of my head. And as I look up, we heard this last week. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. Oh, wow. I lift up my eyes. I see the one who wants to cause me to rise on wings like an eagle. He changes that confession. It goes on in verse 11 here. And they say, our bones are dried up. And then they say, our hope is gone. I'd lost their hope. They couldn't see past their current circumstances. They were in a place of captivity. Or if they were still in Israel, they were in a place of destruction and despair where the enemies come and went as they wanted to. There was no, there was no strong man. There was no army that could rise up against the. They were, they were living in the city without walls. Anyone had access to it. They were like the joke of the nations that surrounded them. They said, well, we've lost hope. But hope is the positive, literally, the positive anticipation of something good. And God wants us to be filled with hope. And I think this, that it's birthed out of our relationship with Him. Romans 15 and verse 13, it says this, May the God of hope, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope is not just some positive state of mind that we can meditate ourselves into or that we can convince ourselves of being in. It, hope actually comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's something that He generates in us. It's, 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 it's like part of the nature of God on the inside of us. I don't know, I forget where it is. It's in Corinthians somewhere. Uh, that Paul's writing and he talks about this. He says, now these, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest, but, but, but faith and hope, I, I think faith incubates hope. Or faith insulates hope. I think it's like we've got hope on the inside of us, but faith surrounds that and incubates it. Psalm 62 and verse 5 puts it this way. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. Find rest, O my soul. I love that. That's so important for us. You know, Jesus says it the same thing in Matthew eleven twenty nine. You know, when He's talking about all you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. And... Um, uh, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light, I'll give you rest for your souls. You know, our, our emotions, I mean, we think of our soul as being our mind and our will and our emotions. Our emotions can so easily attach themselves to hopelessness, equally to positivity if something good's happening. But if, if negative things are happening around their lives, our emotions get so easily carried away with that and attach themselves to the negativity. And all of a sudden, we begin to feel insecure or inadequate or unable. Our mind can work against us because it's always calculating what it can or cannot do in the natural. In fact, the Bible says that the, the, the mind of man is at war with the things of the Spirit. And, and, and it, our will is a powerful force in our lives. But our will can become deflated or feel defeated when it comes up against obstacles or, or situations or circumstances that, 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 are, that, that are hard to overcome or that are hopeless. So if we don't find rest for those areas of our lives, if we don't find rest for our souls, we, it, it, it can so easily get carried away into hopelessness. And for me, I mean, Carol asked me this question this afternoon. I, I, I was kind of, you know, running through the message with her because she's not, she was not here this evening. And she goes, well, how do I... Find rest for my soul. Don't you think people will ask that question? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just telling them about it. She said, no, you, you can't just tell people about that. If, if, you, if you think it's so important, well, how do you get rest for your soul? Rest for our souls is found in His presence. When we're, and I, again, it, it comes to me out of what Dale was talking about this morning, the spirit to spirit, the communication. This living and loving relationship, this, this, this living and presence where we're engaging with Him, whether we're speaking in tongues or we're praying in English or we're worshiping or we're reading the Word. We're allowing Him to speak into our lives and, 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 and our, our soul gets to rest and relax a little bit. Hey, hey, emotions, take a back seat. 
I'm not going to be dictated to by my feelings, no matter if they're good or bad. I'm not going to let my will tell me to go and do something else. I'm not going to allow my, my, my mind to, to tell me that naturally I shouldn't be doing this. I should be engaged in, 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 in like washing the dishes. Well, no, I'm going to allow my soul, my spirit to spend some time in the presence of the Lord. Soul, take a back seat. Have, have a rest. Relax. Learn to, learn to take a break. You don't have to carry such a heavy burden. The passage goes on in Ezekiel 37 and verse 11. Our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, and we are cut off. I say, look, we've lost connection with God. We feel separated as a people. We're displaced from the, 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 the place, the land that we dwell in. We've, we've been taken out of the land that's flowing with milk and honey and deposited again in slavery under this despotic emperor, emperor who, 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 who's just mad and cruel and, and, and he's setting up statues that he's made himself and calling them gods and asking us to worship them and punishing us on pain of death if we don't do it. We've lost connection with our God. We've been cut off and we're separated. And that's never a good place to be in. But the reality is that it's not true of us. We're never separated from God. Hebrews 13, 5, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Acts 17, 28. It's in Him that we live and we move and we have our being. We can't be separated from him. Even the psalmist says he remembers that we're dust without him, without his breath on us, without his life in us, without his presence. We'd crumble away to nothingness. We're never separated from him. In fact, listen, listen to this. I, I love this. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you go through that list, height nor depth, angel nor demon, no created thing, nothing in all of creation, no natural thing, no supernatural thing, no imaginary thing, no perceived thing, no thing that's active in my life right now can ever separate me from the great love that he has for me. We can't be separated from him. Now, I'd like to invite the musos to come back up, please. The psalmist in Psalm 16 begins to see, say, say some amazing stuff in relation to what it is to have a wrong confession or to, to lose hope or to feel cut off. And David says as he writes this, Lord, you alone are my portion. You are my cup and you make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance in the Lord. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I love that. Even at night, my heart instructs me. You know, the word that's used in the Old Testament for heart can also be translated as spirit. Even at night, my spirit counsels me. Our spirit never sleeps. Our body, which needs rest, amen, lies down and we have a refreshing sleep. Maybe our soul's at rest in that moment as well but our spirits and continued connection with God. And I would like to encourage you that even if you, as you go to bed tonight, you lay down and say, God, why don't you begin to speak to me through the watches of the night? My body might be asleep. My eyes might be closed. My brain might be switched off a little bit. But won't that just make it all the much easier? Come and give me dreams and revelations in the middle of the night. Even if you wake me, begin to speak to me. Let my ears be pierced. Let my heart be open to receive all that you have for me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. 
He's talking about his relationship with God, being secure in that. And then in verse 9, he says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Now listen to this again. Therefore my heart is glad. You know our heart is the place that we incubate hope. When we say our, 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 our hope is gone, I've lost hope. The psalmist says, therefore my heart is glad. My hope is secure. And my tongue rejoices. I've got a good confession. My body will also rest c- c- secure. I'm connected. I'm not cut off. That's the good confession we make over our lives. Come on, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because I haven't lost hope. I carry a good confession and I'm not cut off. Maybe you're listening to this message tonight or anything that's transpired this evening, actually. You go, you know what? I, I have carried a wrong confession. I have spoken over myself that I'm not good enough or that life sucks or that it's too hard. Well, I want you to let God change your language tonight. I want you to allow Him to bring you a new confession. I love what Psalm... I, 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 I can't help but use Scripture. I've got nothing to say. <laughs> So, I mean, I've, in fact, I've got a whole lot of stuff to say. But I can't put it any more succinctly than what the Word of God does. I, 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 I just, I love to invest this in my life. Sometimes I get convicted that I'm not doing it enough. And all of a sudden I realize I'm being a little bit religious about it. I got to take a break. I got to, you know. And a while ago I was trying to prepare a message and I've got this, not a, I just like to take the day before I preach to spend in His presence. And that's what I thought. I think it's not religious. It's just something that I love to do. One particular day, nothing was actually happening. Like, man, this is really hard work. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to do some vain repetition. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, what are you doing? I said, oh, uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying harder. You know, he said to me, just take a break. It's okay to take, why don't you go, why don't you go hunting? He said to me, I said, God, that's not you. <laughs> you wouldn't say that to me. I enjoy it too much. And he's laughing. I remember I went out that day. It was the first stag I ever shot. I was wandering through the bush. Oh man. I'm so far in, I don't want to carry an animal out from this far. So I started to go back towards the car. When I was within like 150 meters of the car, I'd stopped and I'd looked around. And I, I'm not, I, some people don't like hunting stories. I'm not going to tell you any gruesome details. But as I was standing there, you know, this didn't really work out very well. I had a great time, thanks. It hasn't really helped me putting a message together. I was having those we thought, and I looked up, and here's this, Stag staring at me. Amen, brother. <laughs> I bought it home and it just followed me, you know. <laughs> Come on, here, boy. I got a message put together that just flowed so easily. Because we, 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 we do want to be a little bit careful, we don't want to become religious about it because there's a freedom in it. Psalm 40 and verse 2 and 3. This is where I was really going. A confession. David says this. He also brought me up out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock and he established my steps. He's put a new song in my mouth. God, I don't know what you hear when you hear that, but for me, it's God, you've changed my life. God, you've rescued me. God, you've transformed me. God, you've set my feet on something solid instead of standing on... sinking sand I will not be moved I foresee the Lord always before me for he is at my right hand that I will not be shaken that's the confession that I want to carry all the days of my life maybe you're here and you've, you've lost hope sometimes we, we spoke about this so powerfully when um, the basic Sozo conference that we did earlier in the year there's a spirit of hopelessness over, over, over this province well you don't need to partner with that but it's not just about not partnering with it you, you we need to contend against it sometimes. 
Proverbs 13 and 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire comes, it's a tree of life. You know when some good thing that you've been hoping for comes to pass in your life, it's a reason for celebration. You should be ringing your friends and your family and telling them about it because it's a good confession coming out of your mouth. It'll energize you. I want you to let the God of hope fill you with fresh tonight. Even where hopelessness abounds, there's still hope in God. It's like letting the Holy Spirit just breathe on you. Maybe you feel cut off or separated. Well, I want you to choose today to reconnect with Him. So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In fact, I want to take this opportunity right now. Maybe you're here and you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life. You don't know what it's like to have a relationship with Him. Well, I want to give you an opportunity tonight to invite Him into your world. To say, you know what, I'd like to connect with Him. I'd like to know Him. I'd like to have a relationship with Him. Why don't we just bow our heads and close our eyes just in the last moments tonight. And if that's you here tonight, you don't know Jesus. You've never prayed a prayer inviting Him into your life. You can't for sure say, you know what, I'm in connection with Him. I would like you just to raise your hand so that I will know that you want me to pray for you. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer with you tonight. If there's anyone here that goes, you know what, I'd like to step into relationship, to connection with Jesus tonight, with a God who loves me and who's for me. I'm just going to give you a little bit more time to raise your hand. Say, you know what, that's me. Amen. You know, we want Him to come. Like Ezekiel prophesied from the four winds. Come, oh breath, come from the four winds. Breathe on us. We want you know, any which way He chooses. From the gentlest breeze to the most glorious tempest or, 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 or the most hardcore gale force wind. <laughs> the presence, the presence. It's the presence. But it's not always the gale force wind. It's sometimes just the gentle breeze giving us direction, guidance, motivation, counsel, comfort. If you want to respond to any of those areas tonight, I'm going to open up the altar call as we step into worship. I just want you to come before God. And I'm believing this. I, I, I truly feel this. That the wind of the Spirit is going to blow on you afresh tonight. Begin to bring transformation and change. It's going to help you change your confession. It's going to breathe hope into your life. It's going to calm and make you feel connected instead of separated and cut off. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let the team lead us. Amen.